Up next on Coastal Today, CCU takes the lead in training young women to become leaders. Our own CIA analyst weighs in on the recent Edward Snowden intelligence crisis and a free series about 20th century pop music comes to CCU. Now your host, Robin Russell. Hello and thanks for joining us. Make way for the young women of CCU as they train to become leaders. For the fourth consecutive year, CCU will host a national program called Elect Her Campus Women Win. CCU student leader Ileana Pedron is already experiencing success from this training, and she serves as our liaison for Elect Her Campus Women Win. Ileana, welcome. Thank you. Um, let's talk about, first of all, what we're facing as women in leadership roles. Well, we face opposition from both men and women, and I think that sometimes our harshest critics can be women themselves. I've been in a room where I, the, hostility, the hostility was almost tangible, but after talking to them and like telling them what my stance was and everything, I felt like I really broke ground with them. Tell me about the Elect Her organization. It's a great program. It helps train young women to run for office. It inspires them and it encourages them to run for office, like maybe if they have um, lost an election one time, like it encourages them to get back up and run again. Um, you have been a student leader in, in lots of arenas. Um, tell me what it was like to try to become a leader here at CCU as a woman. Well, at first it was it wasn't that hard because I was just running for senator. But as it um, as I ran for a higher position, I definitely felt face the opposition. I definitely felt it because I was running against seven other opponents and I knew that I had to step up my game. I had to, I had to um, go the extra mile to make sure that I stood out and that they knew my name. Um, what is that extra mile? Well, um, I just made sure that I campaigned to a lot of student organizations. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of help from Caitlin Page because um, she was running for student body president and she's a great friend of mine. So. We went in together, and so it was a lot easier going in with her and knowing that she was facing the same things that I was. Now, you've had some more training. You went to D.C. this summer. Yes, um, that was awesome. It was an incredible experience. I got to meet um, young women from all over the country and hear their different like perspectives and things like that. Now, you're a junior communication major. Um, what do you hope to do after you graduate? After I graduate, I hope to go back into the political arena and help other women campaign and win their elections. Um, what is it that, that you're going to take away from CCU and put to work um, for your future plans? For, from CCU, I'm going to take the pride that I have for being a Chanticleer, the pride that I have for um, all the hard work that I put into student government, like learning how to talk to people and things like that. And what's your greatest experience been so far? Definitely campaigning. I loved meeting new people, um, people I'd never spoken to before, and hearing their concerns and things like that. Ileana, congratulations on all your success. <laughs> and we so look much. forward to seeing what you do after you graduate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Up next on Coastal Today, one of the hottest topics of today's headlines, the whistleblowing of former CIA and NSA agent Edward Snowden. Were his actions ethical? And later, names and faces you'll need to know. Meet the folks in charge of philanthropy at CCU. Welcome back to Coastal Today. In 2012, former CIA and NSA worker Edward Snowden leaked highly sensitive classified details of U.S. and British government activity to media. Today, Questions still beg to be answered. Is Snowden a hero or a criminal? Were his actions ethical? CCU's own former CIA analyst, Cynthia Storr, brings this discussion to our campus on January 30th through the Jackson Center's Tea and Ethics series. Cindy, it's great to have you back Thank you. I'm today. Glad to be here. Um, you were in the trenches in the CIA for many, many years, and First, you know, I, I know you can say things and you can't say things, but I, I want to know, can you share your insights to the Snowden events? Well, let me talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> data collection. Yes. And obviously, I have to be very careful about this. Yes. 
Also, lots of things happened after I left, so I don't even know anymore. <laughs> and that is the truth. I'm not lying. <laughs> um, you know, one of the one of the difficult the reason the U.S. government got into the business of collecting all of this information is the frustrations we encountered before and after 9/11 in trying to thwart terrorist plots. So, you know, if you if you're doing things in the traditional way that we used to do them and it would take a long time and you might not get what you needed in time mm -hmm. to stop something mm -hmm. and so people were saying well if industry and this is an important point industry was already taking everybody's information and selling it to each other and they still do yes they have a lot more of your information than the US government does frankly and they use it for commercial purposes not for national security <laughs> And the point was, if industry can do that, why can't the Absolutely, U.S. government yes. do it for our safety? So that's how this gets started. But there's always a question when you're going down a new road of where's the limit? And that's the debate that, you know, we're having now. Is that, you know, what, what limit, what is too much? Um, as this was unfolding, were you, you know, what were you thinking and how close were you following all of this? You know, to tell you the truth, I wasn't following it all that closely right. because I just, it's radioactive. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with this. <laughs> But I've had to look into it a lot more um, lately, and I've been talking to some people who've been working on it. So. Um, do we, as, as not in the government, as citizens, have a clue of how fast um, our data can be grabbed up? I mean, is it just more than we can imagine? I mean, give us a sense of do we have privacy? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, you could theoretically. Right, right. Technologically, if you look at what we're able to do technologically, no. I don't think so from what I can read between the lines, but right, again, I, right. I don't know exactly what can be done. But in terms of process and law, you can have privacy. And that's, you know, that's what we need to do in a democracy is figure out what is it that we're going to say is acceptable. What's the trade-off between our privacy and our security? Right? Do we want our government to be able to get every piece of information on everybody everywhere all the time? Or do we want to put some limits on that and accept the consequences that we might not be as safe? What will you be talking about at the Tea and Ethics? Well, I think what, what we'll do is try to lay out some frameworks to yeah. help people think about the problem. Yes. Okay? So there's some legal frameworks to talk about, um, the differences between uh, how will civil disobedience play into this, what is whistleblowing according to the U.S. law as opposed to according to practice, which is different. There's not a lot of whistleblower protections according to U.S. law. But a lot of people do it eth for ethical reasons, right. so we'll have that discussion. Um, another part of the discussion that's going on out there is a lot of people say, well, Snowden, he would have been fine. He would have been an ethical whistleblower if he had just stuck to NSA um, collecting information about U.S. persons. But he's talking about, you know, we're collecting information on other governments and stuff like that. And of course, every government does some some mm -hmm. bit of that. But his response is that you know there there is a higher obligation here to humanity, and we ourselves have made that argument in places like the the Nuremberg trials. So we'll have to tackle all of those issues, and this really is a human issue because U.S. policy is and has been. This was a, one of the documents he leaked, but it's also been in the military strategy open source documents for years that our policy is total information dominance, that we can control every bit of communications on the planet, anytime, anywhere. That's our policy. Do, is, that, is that acceptable? <sighs> and Cynthia, if anyone wants to ask those questions or get those questions answered January the 30th, T and Ethics. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're always a pleasure. You're always interesting, and I know you're going to pack the house. You better get there early <laughs> if you want to see Cynthia and ask her questions. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, learn about more work critically important to CCU's growth and success, and America's history of pop music comes to CCU. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Private funding is vital to CCU's successes. We remind you that only about 4.6% of CCU's budget is funded by state appropriations. The university's Office for Philanthropy works hard to identify folks who believe in CCU and want to impact the lives of our students through giving. 
Mark Roach, is now the new Vice President of CCU's Office for Philanthropy. He's joined by Mark Kiskunas, our new Senior Director for Philanthropy. Mark and Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Mark Roach, we're going to start with you. Um, you moved over from the Chanticleer Athletic Foundation where you have had huge successes. Um, you must be excited about this promotion and probably a little bit nervous. Um, bring us up to date. Ah, yeah, I am very excited and, and we've been very fortunate. We mm -hmm. were very blessed in, in the uh, Athletic Foundation to get some great gifts. And so uh, we're hoping to take what we learned in the Athletic Foundation, expand upon it and, and make it a, you know, a great situation for philanthropy. Um, how important is this to CCU? It's just so exciting because, you know, you can't, uh, you, you can't uh, understand just the impact until you're on campus, until you see, you know, just all of the students and how they're impacted. And so it's, it's just important, you know, important to continue growing. Uh, and Mark Kaskunas, welcome. Thanks. You're a CCU graduate, of course, and a huge supporter. Um, but you've held um, positions at Nations Bank, um, Royal Bank of Canada, Plantation Federal Bank. You're, you're active in civic um, leadership. Um, why did you take this next step to be on our philanthropy team? Well, you, you brought up a great statistic, and, and less than 5% of, of the funding uh, comes from our state. And it's just such a need, and it's so fun to be part of a campus providing a half a billion dollar economic impact to our community. And being in corporate uh, and commercial banking for the last 20 years, it's just how can you not get excited about what's going on at Coastal and on campus? And also then the need to keep helping students. I, I'm a product of, of, of our Wall School of Business, and I owe my start in my career in banking to some of those professors. Um, and so I just want to give back at this point in my life. To and be part of something special. Not to mention your mark on the other side. You also are an alumnus of CCU. Yeah, and you know, and it is special. Obviously, anytime you can work at the place where you went to school is, is so exciting, and, and to see it grow and to see what's becoming is just, it's just incredible. Uh, mark, paint a little bit of the landscape of what is ahead for you guys. What we're looking at now is uh, the possibility of an endowment campaign, and so we'll be working hard to uh, to to uh, sum up that. But what we need is we need to be somewhere around the $100 million mark for an endowment. And, and, and right now for a university of our age, we're probably at somewhere close to 30. And so, so that's a, a large area that we've got to work on. And so that's going to be the, uh, the gist of what we'll be about probably in the next seven years. Um, mark, how easy is it going to be to sell this institution at this point? Well, that, that's the greatest part. Is, is, is you, if you, the hardest part is just getting people on campus because once right. they're here it blows oh their mind oh all the construction and all the beauty and everything that's going on and and just again all the construction and and it's just fun for me i've got to fortunate to be in this community this whole time to watch it grow yeah. but the folks that have graduated throughout the years and haven't been on campus and once they get here it just blows their mind and they get excited about what coastal has been doing did for them and what it's going to continue to do for generations to come and our excellence in in the academics our, our graduates are going places and they've done fabulous things um, our athletics um, what is it that you want our viewers to know that they may not know about ccu right now I think for me is just, you know, please come on campus, see yes. what we're producing, mm -hmm. see, see the impact that we have on the entire community and the entire state. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is we're going to do as many lunches on campus as we possibly can to get people back. Mark? Absolutely. And I, th I think the exciting thing is the MBA programs, the Wall School, having a PhD, a doctorate. I, I go wow. and tell people, yes. so you realize yes. you, can get a, you can be a doctor from Coastal Carolina University in your own backyard. How cool is that? And again, just getting people on campus and seeing all the great things going on. Absolutely. I'm um, with Mark and Mark. How exciting. And we better let our viewers that you'll be coming to see them. Thank you. Thank you. Listen up. A great opportunity awaits to learn how the 29th century American music has influenced modern culture. The America's Music Series at CCU when Coastal Today continues. CCU is one of only 50 sites nationwide to host an incredible series called America's Music, a film history of our popular music from blues to bluegrass to Broadway. Amy Tully and CCU's Department of Music present this series along with our Kimball Library. Amy, what can we look forward to with this American Music? The um, series is a six session series that will feature different kinds of America's music, America's genres of music that are distinct to America. 
for example, the um, first film that we'll be showing is on um, gospel music and the blues, and we'll be also showing a film on Broadway music, um, bluegrass and country, and as well as rock and roll, mambo, and hip hop. So each time we have a session, we show a film. Um, sometimes the films are by some of the most important filmmakers in the business, like Martin Scorsese, so very important people. And then we'll be hosting a scholarly discussion after the films about how this music has affected our American life. Um, now, in the intro, I said it's one of 50 sites. Right. So how did CCU become one of those 50 sites? We, um, myself and Patty Edwards, who is also in the music department, we wrote a grant, and the grant outlined why we thought this series would be good for Coastal Carolina University and the community. And so we were selected, and we were, um, in the selection process, decided that we would also present some of these sessions off campus as well. So Patty and I will also be hosting some of these sessions in the Sockesty Library and the Carolina Forest Library in the community. So we're really trying to do a broad range of um, showing these films because they're so important. Um, congratulations on that grant, Amy. Thank you. But uh, in, in that grant, why do you think it's important to bring this series here? Well, I think that we are very familiar with rock and roll, we're very familiar mm -hmm. with country music, and perhaps we're more familiar with even um, hip hop, but there's so many other kinds of American genres that have affected our everyday lives when you factor in historical events and the influence of technology that it has had on our American music, like re recording and digital um, music and recording. So um, I think that by using this series and hosting it, it really shows the community and um, anyone who's interested the effect that this kind of music has had on our American culture. Um, and this is another great opportunity for our community members because this event is free. Uh, it is free and it is going to be held in the auditorium at the Wall Building. Mm -hmm. And it usually runs about um, two hours. The program is set to start at seven. We'll do an, a brief introduction, show the film, and then follow with a scholarly kind of question and answer discussing the film and the historical events that we'll find that are significant in the film. And then we'll be following the discussion with some live music. So um, why not end the sessions with live music that we're going to be hearing that kind of music in the films? But it's definitely free and um, we'll have some refreshments and that kind of thing, um, but um, definitely free for the public and anyone is invited to come. Amy, congratulations on, on such a find and, and all the grant work that you guys did. Um, we look forward to this series. Thank you. Thank you. This series is free and if you would like to know more about America's Music Series, go to coastal.edu cultural arts and click on the calendar. Up next on Coastal Today, we're going places with Martha Hunt to meet a CCU alumnus making a difference. Stay tuned. Coastal Carolina University graduates are going places in this world. Let's check in with Martha Hun to meet another outstanding alumnus. We are always in hot pursuit of CCU graduates making a difference in this world and we hit pay dirt when we received an email from another graduate actually, little brother to the guy sitting next to me, Adam Wilson, we also know him as Frog, and he emailed us saying wonderful things about his big brother, Mickey Wilson, who is head coach here at Myrtle Beach High School. And thank you so much for letting us catch up with you to find out what you're doing, Mickey. Well, thank you for having me. I paid him $20 to send that email, so uh, <laughs> I have to make sure I pay up, but um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, and it's great. It was wonderful to receive that email, and he was telling us all of the wonderful things that you are working on. And of course, I was embarrassed that I did not have you on my radar. I'm glad that we do now. You're head coach at Myrtle Beach High School and have experienced some wonderful successes. Let me back up. You graduated in 1997 with a physical education degree. Now that degree is evolving at CCU now. Back in 97, uh, what was that like for you to be on that campus and studying something that you love? Well, it was great. Um, I, I worked with Dr. John Farley, who's retired now, um, Dr. Tom Cook, who's retired now, and I still see both of those guys. Um, I see Dr. Farley over here at our stadium exercising, and I see Dr. Cook goes to our church. And uh, so, you know, to see those guys, and they did a tremendous job of, uh, of preparing us to be professionals. 
Um, and I, it's, it's neat to see those guys out. And it, it was great. Coastal was a great experience. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, great quality education right here on the Grand Strand. So it was, it was tremendous. I enjoyed my time at Coastal. And we're very fortunate in our community because you've taken what you learned and applied it right here fresh out of school, hired at Carolina Forest High School to coach, worked with Mark Roach, who is now in charge of philanthropy at the university. So connections still maintained in the community. We're there for four years and then came here to Myrtle Beach High School. So well, that's very fortunate for us that you've been here and continued to help our children grow and learn and make a difference in the world. Can you, I know it's a little bit braggadocious, but will you share the successes that you all are experiencing here at Myrtle Beach? Well, we've been very fortunate. Um, we, we won the state championship this year um, in 3A football, 2013. Um, we, we won it in 2010. Um, we won it in 2008. So we've had some success here on the football field. It's been great. It's been a great experience. I've certainly enjoyed uh, in 2008. We, I was the offensive coordinator. In 2010, I was the head coach, 2013 head coach. And it's just been great. It's, it's great to uh, be a part of a program that's been successful. I've been very blessed, very fortunate to, to be here. I know time is everything. And just, just really lucked out and being in the right place at the right time and, uh, and having great kids and great coaches and a great, com great football community. Well, we're very proud of you. Thank you for being such a great ambassador for CCU, for being a committed Shauna Clear. And uh, we appreciate what you're doing in the community and here at Myrtle Beach High School, Mickey. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Robin, we're going to send it back to you now for more of Coastal Today. Thanks, Martha. And thank you for joining us. Coastal Today would love to hear from you. Send an email with any comments or suggestions to coastaltoday at coastal.edu. And you can view Coastal Today on our website at coastal.edu forward slash coastal today. Thanks for watching Coastal Today, an inside look at Coastal Carolina University.